The greatest enemy that uh, Pastor uh, Darren will face uh, is not the devil. The greatest enemy you face is not the devil. I, I just want to kind of get this out. It's in my spirit. The greatest enemy that we face in the body of Christ collectively is not the devil. I know that sounds absurd, but let me just walk this a little bit further. The greatest enemy we face individually in our own Christian walk is not the devil. Now, the reason I say that, because according to Scripture, the devil has already been defeated through the shed blood of Jesus Christ that we're covered with. Would you agree to that? And the Scripture tells us that they overcame him in Revelation by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. First John 3 and 8 says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Colossians 2.15 says, Having spoiled principalities and powers, Jesus made a show or a display of him openly triumphing over him in it. So according to the scripture, the devil can't just come in and box you around anytime he wants to. He can't just come in and smack you around. If there's going to be any smacking done, you're the one that has the authority to take dominion and authority and to smack him around and tell him to get out of your face. You're not a weak-kneed pygmy standing in a soup line begging for a handout. You're a child of the Most High God. The power of Christ that was in him shall also quicken your mortal bodies. We're overcomers, according to 1 John 4 and 4. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Romans 8, 31, if God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 37, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Romans 8, 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth. And if that doesn't cover it, this does, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't shout, I'm going to throw this microphone at you right now. In the name of you. Shout it out right now. The devil is under my feet. Now I want to say this. My wife has a saying that she's used for years and it'll, it gets your attention. She'll get up a lot of mornings and the first thing out of her mouth will be, devil, are you up yet? You're under my feet. Hallelujah. And when you think about that, that's what the scripture says. All of these creeping things, according to the scripture, are under your feet. Well, there's no bigger creep than the devil. He's under your feet. I want you to get that. He's under your feet and you have power and authority over the devil. Now, once that's been said, I want to take this then to the step that I want to drive this home then the greatest enemy that we face in the body of Christ and the pastor will face and all of us will face is to understand this. Based on what you've just heard as the foundation of our salvation and that we're conquerors, then the greatest enemy we face in our life is a little tiny thing in our mouth. It's about that long. And some people, it's about, of course, none of them are here. I left them all somewhere else. Uh, you know, it's not, I, I know some people that have such a long tongue, if they were to sit in the living room, they could lick a spoon in the kitchen. Now, that wasn't very spiritual, but you know what? I, I'm talking about words now. The thing that I want to speak to you about this morning is aligning what comes out of your mouth with the word of the living God. Now, Mark 13, 31 is the same as Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never, ever pass away. Now, we live in a, we live in a situation to where everything changes. Uh, spouses change. Uh, political systems change. Presidents change. People change. Everything around you is subject to change. But the most powerful assurance that we have is to know there's one thing 
this is really good preaching already right here, so don't make me do my own amening here right now. The greatest thing is to know that there's something that we have that is not subject to alteration or change. And it's the word of the living God. It never changes. So what I want you to understand that everything that comes out of our mouth affects every hearer of that that comes out of your mouth. Everything that comes out of our mouth, it charges the atmosphere with faith or with fear. Everything that comes out of our mouth makes us feel like we can take a city for God or it has just the opposite effect. Everything, in other words, that comes out of your mouth, it affects people. Now, when I think about this, I think about that the most important thing, even as I stand here this morning as an evangelist, everything that I'm, that's coming out of my mouth, according to the Word of God, has an impact or an effect upon everybody. Well, I know that my desire at the conclusion of this this morning will be that we will understand that what I say affects everyone. It not only affects those in the pew, but everything that comes out of our mouth affects the one that's the leader of the church. Every word you speak affects not only yourself and the hearer, but it also affects the pulpit. And by the same token, the pew will never rise in the level of its faith than what comes out of the pulpit. So in other words, we make a commitment here this morning and a decision. I have to choose. I make a choice. Now, the word says it this way in Proverbs 6 and 2. Thou art snared, or one translation, thou art stymied or withheld or held back by what comes out of your mouth. Now, I know this is nothing new to because we've heard it through the years, but I felt like this morning it is absolutely imperative in my heart to bring this to you today because everything that comes out of our mouth according to the word of God either puts us over or it puts us under it makes you a balcony person or a basement person now the balcony people are always saying to what comes out of that pulpit brother Lee brother Darren what comes out of that pulpit it puts people in a place to where if they're balcony people, they're saying, we can do that. I believe that. We can take a city for God. We can be an overcomer. Our basement people will say, we, we can't do that. Well, there's, there's no way we can do that. So in other words, you make a choice. Are you a basement person or are you a balcony person? Well, I want to be, as an evangelist, I'd like to be a balcony evangelist. I'd like to walk in here and say to you this morning what I believe in my heart. I believe in my heart the greatest days for harvest time, this great church, the greatest days are not behind you. They're ahead of you. I'm going to speak that. I'm believing that the greatest that you've ever witnessed is not in the history, but it's in the future. So Pastor Darren is actually standing on the shoulders of Pastor Lee. Every person in my life that's ever spoken a word of encouragement in the past, like my father that pastored for over 60 years, like my father-in-law that pastored 50 or 60 years, all of these men that spoke into my life, my dad, and every soul that I have ever seen won to God, I'm not going to be the one standing in the front of the line to get the reward for that. 
It's going to be the one on whose shoulders I have stood on. Don't ever forget this, Brother Darren. I'm a granddad. I can speak this into your lap, but don't ever forget this. Just think about what is before you right now. Think about the tears that have been shed, the ground that has been plowed, the, the, the battles that your father has fought for you right now at this moment. Here's what I want to say. Thank you, Pastor Lee. Thank you, Sister Sharon. Thank you for the seed that you have sown. And Brother Darren, we're not going to forget. You, we're not going to forget that we stand on the shoulders of your own father that has paid the price. Now, everybody say words. Turn to your neighbor and say, the man's talking about words. I'm going to put my mind, that's what that pocket, if you've ever wondered what it's for, that's what that's for. I heard Rod Parsley say, after all these years, I finally figured out what to do with a hand mic. That's what that pocket God gave me right there. You might have to fire me up and let me get myself together here a little bit. But I, I, want, to, I want to tell you this. It's, it's on my heart. I was 34 years old when I became pastor now in, uh, in uh, California. Now, I was born and raised in Fort Worth, and Joan Nell's a, a Dallas girl, uh, but actually born in Pampa, but she's a Dallas girl, and that's where her dad passed. So two preachers, kid, that's how we connected and, and so uh, we, we both, you know, in, in the ministry like that, well, then when we're evangelizing, then this church called me and said, will you come and be our pastor? Well, I had preached a meeting for them out in California, and all of a sudden it was like the last thing in the world in 1974 in the month of May, the last thing I thought would happen to me was I'm going to California now to be a pastor. Well, first of all, I had told the Lord, I'm, I'll go anywhere, but I'm not going to California. I'll even go to Waco, but I'm not going to California. Well, I discovered real quickly, if you're going to obey God, you're going to behave yourself and, okay, Lord, I'll do what you want. So here I am now at the age of 34, younger that I found out than you are by about four, four years or so, something like that. So I was younger than you are when I became a pastor. Well, I didn't know anything about pastoring. So I went in there into that church, Zonel and I did, to become uh, the pastor of that church. And uh, I didn't know anything about pastoring. All I knew was to win the loss to Christ. That's always on my mind. So I got up on that first uh, Sunday, and I got all fired up. And first time to be a pastor and it sounded strange to me and I'm 34 years old and what do I know so I just got up and decided to preach what was on my heart and it was here's what I said folks right in the middle of that message I said we're going to take this city for God well I'm telling you I don't know what happened but it it sparked something in that congregation now, I remember how many people were there that morning because it had that Sunday school thing they used to put up that told you how many were in Sunday school, and it said 513. So there I was preaching, and all of a sudden I said, we're going to take this city for God. Well, we had a beautiful uh, Italian uh, uh, grandma in that church, and she said, just like you are right here, except one, one person over, like right here, and her name was Puzio. And so when I said that, people started clapping. Well, I'd never heard clapping in church other than during the song service. Well, I mean, it was, it, it, I, I kind of went back like that. They just started clapping. And that, that's where, by the way, clapping began to sweep the world. It started, okay, never mind that. And so Mama Puzio, when it kind of died down, jumped up and she's ultra Pentecostal. She had that hair thing going way up here and a big artificial flower stuck in the top of that beehive looking thing that you got going on there. And then she had that Holy Ghost thing, goes, the Holy Ghost thing like this. Oh. Everybody, that'll help your neck like that. I'm about making fun. It's just sweet. And boy, she did that and, that. and when she popped her neck like that, that flower went flying right out in the middle of the aisle right here like this. And I thought, well, that's confirmation what I just said. We're going to take this city for God. Well, after the service, you know, it was really, it was exciting. First service. 
So, so, so people came up after the service, you know, and they just, they just besieged me with, uh, you know, kind things to say. We're glad you're here, da, 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 and all this kind of thing. And I thought, boy, this pastor thing, it's a snap. There's nothing to this. That's not good. It's, it's just a snap, Brother Darren. It's just a snap. Nothing to it, just like that. And so I got up here, and it's about 1, one o'clock or so, and I, I'm putting my stuff together, you know, getting ready to leave. Well, folks are coming up. I'm shaking hands, and, and we carried on till about 1.30 in the afternoon. It was just kind of like a little sweet thing. So then I'm, I'm over here, and, and I'm, I'm about finished up, and I noticed one more guy standing right over here. So I, I walk over to him and put my hand out, and he said, kind of like this, he said, we're glad to have you as our pastor, Brother Thompson. And I said, well, thank you very much. And then he said, however. <laughs> now, I did well enough in school to know that when however gets into the middle of a sentence, it means we're going to turn around and we're heading in another direction. He said, uh, however, you're, you're not going to feel this church, and you're not going to feel that balcony as that you were saying in your sermon like that. So he began to just tell me uh, and uh, why I'm not. He said that other pastor, he was here, he said stuff like that, and then the one before him, and, you know, y'all come in here and say stuff like that, and that's, no, you just shouldn't be doing that. Well, when he got through with me, uh, Brother Darren, I just kind of like felt kind of small like that. I, I didn't know how to do it, so I just put my hand out, you know, and shook it. And Dad always said, you know, son, no matter what people say, just be a, a nice guy and all that. And so I just hugged him and went on my way. Now, now uh, maybe Brother Lee could tell me why that is, but I forgot about everybody else that seemed to be uh, on board with what I was saying. I, I just, all I could think about was that one person. And it sort of got on my nerves a little bit. So, it, it, so I decided the next week, for some reason, I just got up and preached on taking the city for God part two. And so I just fired away and I said, folks, not only is the balcony going to be filled, but we're going to need uh, folding chairs and we're going to have to put them in the aisles, and, uh, and which is true. And so I had called a salvage yard and, 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 uh, and got 600. I ordered them 600. And they were going to cost six dollars a piece because we're going to need it for the overflow. Well, then I said stuff like that, and everybody got to clapping again. And Mama Pootsie jumped up, "Glory to God! Here's the first of six dollars." Well, they just started bringing money down and throwing it on the floor right down here. We had enough to buy eighteen hundred of those chairs, not six hundred. And so uh, people came up. It was another honeymoon thing for a while. And then I got up and collected my stuff. And I looked over there. And, and there he was again, old Mr. Personality. So I walked over there and stuck my hand out. And I said, isn't the Lord good? And he said, uh, uh, where'd you get the authority to buy those chairs, boy? Well, now that was tacky. Don't you think it's kind of tacky? I ought to lay him out in one sock. But I didn't do that. I just thought. So I just kind of reached out. He just chewed me out. Well, you know what I did? I just hugged him. That's all I did. I just hugged him. God bless you. I didn't say a word. I, didn't, I was negative about it. I just hugged him real big. I did hug him kind of tight. I was hoping I hear a rib crack or something like that. But anyway, no, no, I didn't. I just cut up a little bit. Or maybe I'm not. Well, anyway, so it just kind of like, it just bugged me all week. Well, I didn't know what to do about it. I wanted to tell Zonel about it. You know, I, I wanted to, but I knew better than that because she, she's the woman that, well, for instance, she'd have tapes going in the house. She'd have Brother Copeland preaching, and, uh, Brother Hagen, and uh, others, you know, she'll have them in every room sometimes going all at the same time, different people. I'd walk in that house sometime, you'd hear all that, and you'd walk through there and hear Brother Copeland. Brother Hagen, <laughs> on it would go, and you hear all, and you'd just go like, "Whoa, what? you know." It's a. I said, "How can you understand all this?" And you know, and she'd kind of say, "Well, if you'd, you'd get into this, you'd get it too." And she just walked in that faith realm like that. Well, I'll never forget as long as I live the time that we were facing something, and she would always, uh, if I'd go off and preach during that time, she'd put a little scripture tuck it in in a pen right here in my suit and I, I one time I'm preaching in Atlanta and I did this like this and that pen went into my skin and I'm going like this oh like that 
and they thought I was under the anointing. About half of them jumped up and started shouting all across the building like that. Well, she was just one of these people that just believed. Well, we faced a situation a little bit later on to where we were facing a financial thing. But now I had gotten on television and, and you know, you went from a, a little bit of money to suddenly you're into millions of dollars a year. And we were facing a $300,000 situation that uh, I, I didn't see coming. So I'm sitting there fussing about it that morning and, and Zonel comes in and, and she uh, says, she, uh, I've got a word here from the Lord. And she said, uh, we're about to see the miracle working power of God in action. She said, all you got to do is just get more word in you. Just get some more word in you. You know, just get that word in you, Dwight. And so uh, she's trying to make a point, you know, and I'm drinking my uh, coffee and all of a sudden something's in my mouth and, and I, what was that? And I spit it out and she, it, I un, it was a little note. I unrolled it like something in a fortune cookie and it said, Dwight Thompson, the word is nigh thee even in thy mouth. And she said, you need to just turn this over to God and stand on the word because this is an opportunity to see the miracle working power of God in action. Pastor Lee said it just a few moments ago and, and, uh, and Pastor Darren, I believe, alluded to it. Sometimes the greatest victories you do not ever see and understand the miracle working power of God except when you get into a situation that it's only God that can get you out of that situation. And when you see the enemy attack with everything you've got, get ready. That means you're on the brink of a breakthrough. Get ready. Something good is about to happen. Get ready. The greatest lesson you'll ever learn is not on a mountaintop, but it's what you're made of when you're down in the valley. Anybody can sing when you're on a mountaintop. Anybody can sing when the doctor said everything's good. Anybody can sing when your home is happy, but the devil says, now let's hear you sing when all of hell has broken loose in your life. Words, everything that comes out of your mouth affects. Zonel, I'm going to tell this on you. It just came to my mind. We had that house there in Downey, California. We had these big old tall 30 or foot cypresses or whatever they're called along, along that fence back there. And so she was, she had just prayed for anything and, and everything. Tapes, ministry powerful woman of faith I can tell you uh, being on television for 30 plus years you kind of get people to pat you on the back and whatever they perceive that you are you're not fooled by all of that I realize I would be nothing in the ministry if it hadn't been for that girl over there 57 years. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even be here if it hadn't been for her prayers sticking with me and me traversing this country and preaching several hundred times a year. And I'm not fooled by that. I wouldn't even probably be here today if it hadn't been for her prayers. That faith, when I felt like I couldn't go home, when I think about her and I think about all of these 52 years, she's traveled across this country on most continents that we have preached, overseas crusades that we have preached, the souls we've seen come to God. It's not going to be Dwight Thompson that gets any credit for that. It's going to be that girl right over there that held on to God for her husband. <laughs> words. Everybody just say words. Words make a difference. Well, what I was driving at, I got, I got carried away right there, didn't I? For, forgive me for that. No, don't. I, I, no, I'm glad I said that because it's in my heart. And, but I, I, I think about that time till now when we, that storm was coming through in the year before all of those trees were knocked down. We had to replace them. But that... Three o'clock in the morning, she woke me up and said, Dwight, get up. 
the Lord told me to do something. And I said, well, what is it? She said, it's storming out there. Remember what happened last year this time that knocked all those trees down? Those trees are our trees, and they're going to stand up in the name of Jesus. Get out there and tell them to stand up. <laughs> now, now, this is, this is a factual, exactly the way it happened. Well, I stuck on that old ragged uh, terry cloth uh, robe of mine, and I stood there kind of looking out the patio window, and I said, Sonia, it's storming out there. And, and she said, well, get on out there and go on out there and tell them in the name of Jesus, stand up just like that. Trees, stand up. And so I kind of got out under steel, the patio covering, and I'm going trees quietly, three o'clock in the morning. Stand up, all of you. Get yourself and stand up there. And they, no, not like that. She said, get out there and lay your hands on them in the name of Jesus and tell them. And you know, I wanted to go, you get out there, Miss Press, you know, staying in the dry like that. So we did. We just kind of screamed at them, stand up in the name of the Lord. This is exactly the way it happened. You know what happened? Along that fence for about three blocks, all the way down there, every one of those trees, it looked like it had been knocked down. And they even took pictures of it and they put it in the paper. The only ones that were standing, all of them, was that w house where that crazy woman was that said, get out there and tell those trees to stand up. Well, I want to tell you something. I believe it in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to tell the devil in the name of Jesus. I claim Waco for Jesus Christ. I claim your house. I claim your children. I claim your families. I claim your marriages. I claim whatever you're going through in the name of Jesus. I'm claiming souls as you've never experienced it in the history of harvest time. It's harvest time in Waco, Texas. Everybody clap your hands. Talk among yourself. I'll be right back. Just talk and say howdy. Just click clap until I get through drinking. I'm good. I've got five minutes. Everybody will give me five more minutes. Raise your hand. Put them up. That's five, 10, 15, 20, 20. Thank you very much. Now listen to me closely. Everybody say words. words. Everything that comes out of your mouth affects people. So I got up and preached on taking a city for God part three the next week. So Mama Puccio got so excited. She said, bless some my God. I'm going to be on the TV. I told the folks what's going to happen. We're going to have to put closed circuit television out in those two foyers and get ready for the overflow. Well, I'm telling you, same thing happened. Everybody was excited, and they started bringing an offering. Nobody asked them for it. And that dear brother, he chewed me out again. I just, I just hugged him some more. And then I got up on the next Sunday, number four. I said, taking a city for God part four and I said the day will come we're going to see very quickly at least 25 people a Sunday born into the kingdom of God and what I'm driving at Mama Puccio became the ringleader of the Amen squad she went and had bumper stickers made and she had just saw in the paper, wherever it was, she got a hold of them, had a big uh, sack of them, you know, several hundred of them. And she got her crew together, and they were plastering them all over cars as they got parked up out there. And she was, and they said, we're taking a city for God. That became the theme. Well, suddenly, it became like a momentum. Now, now everybody say words. words. Now, you think this isn't important? Well, let me tell you what James said. James said that the tongue is like a fire. And behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. Then he makes another, he, he alludes to this. He says, the tongue is like the smallest member on a ship, which would be the rudder. But it sets in motion the direction that ship is going to take. So in other words, the smallest member of the body, which is the tongue, sets in motion the direction that you're going to take. Well, now, now, now listen, this is very important. What comes out of your mouth sets in motion the direction of your life. Feet follow your tongue. So now then, what 
my feet are doing are following the direction of what's coming out of my mouth. So here's why I want to bring it. What is going to come out of our mouth from this day forward at harvest time? We're going to speak the direction that we intend to take. We're going to align our tongue, our words, with the word of the living God. The devil is not going to stop us. Our children are coming to God. Our marriages are going to be saved. Our families are going to be restored. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it looks like in the natural. Greater is he than the God that dwells within you than the ruler of this world. I'm here to tell you, get ready from the north and the south and the east and the west. We're believing God for the greatest harvest in the history of this church. Words. Well, let me tell you something. In less than six months, you had to get there early just to get a seat. And as God is my witness from 500 to 2,000 in less than six months, and they would come and fill up that area in that foyer and in that foyer and at times would have to stand out on the parking lot. And the last year that we had the privilege of pastoring that church, we averaged 106 people per Sunday born into the kingdom of God. Now, before anybody thinks that that applause, I think is for me quite the contrary. People caught a hold of the power of the tongue Waco harvest time get this you think you don't matter you think you're somebody sitting there I don't teach a class I don't sing I just come to church I just put my offering in this is all I do let me tell you something you're the one on whose shoulders we're standing. Everyone in this building that ties, maybe they don't even know your name, but let me tell you something. You're the one that you're a part of the master plan. You're a part of the movement. You're a part of what it means for harvest time to take this city for God. You matter. You matter to God more than you think you do. You're doing a whole lot better than you think you are. You're here this morning. The devil may have fought you with everything he has, but I'm proud of you today. You're here this morning. You may be going through a troublesome situation, but you didn't quit. You didn't stay home, but here you are this morning. You're still matter to God. You still are doing better than you think you are. Because no matter what, you're in this thing for the duration. I don't know your name, sir, and your beautiful family that's here, but you really matter to harvest time. And this handsome youngster right here, I could see him coming forth declaring the presence and the power of Almighty God. He's not been born on this earth to feel a hair a needle in his vein or, or cocaine up his nose. Devil, don't even think about it. These children belong to the living God and no weapon formed against any of these children are ever going to prosper. No weapon formed against your pastors are ever going to prosper. No weapon formed against your family is ever going to prosper. In the name of Jesus, I speak faith and power and deliverance over every one of you. Stand to your feet all over this building. Pastor Lee, I want you to come up here if you will, please. And, and uh, Pastor Sharon, I want you to come. And, and then I want Pastor Darren to come up. And Haley and Ethan and we pray for Miss Abby that the Lord will touch her or she would be standing right here. I want you to look at this. Let me have that if you uh, will just for a moment. Before we even uh, pray, 
I want you to reach your hands out and speak this out of your mouth. I want you to say as if your hands could be extended all the way up. And You know, Brother Duke, I want you to come on up here and stand with me up here. Come on up here, sir. Just stand over here. Now, for many years, the baton has been in this hand. Pastor Taryn, he's, you've been that uh, assistant position and you've, it's not like you, it's not like you're starting out from just today. You're like me starting out a preacher's kid and you've, you've been in these altars and you've seen the people come down and my wife said to me a moment ago, my precious wife said to isn't it wonderful to see altars in the church? I can still hear my Uncle Lee. I can take you to the spot on that altar in my dad's church where the Lord saved me. My tear stains are still on there. I'm glad Harvest Time has altars in the church. And so all these years, Pastor Darren, the baton has been carried by your father and your mother. And they've labored They've fought the fight. And so then this ministry that they've been in, now then felt led of the Holy Spirit to pass over the time to Pastor Darren. Place it in his hand. And all the responsibility... And all the weight he will feel different from an assistant pastor and you become the pastor. That's why this morning my message is about let everything that comes out of your mouth to this pulpit say to Pastor Darren, we stand with you. Are you listening to me? We stand with you. We love you. We love First Lady Abby. We love her. We love Haley. We love Ethan. We love Pastor Darren. And we're going to stand with him shoulder to shoulder in the name of Jesus Christ. Now with your hands extended toward him, I want us to pray this prayer. Repeat this after me. In the name of Jesus, as this baton is handed over to Pastor Darren and Abby and Ethan and Haley, we reach out to them as a congregation to let them know we stand with them. We stand with them in prayer, intercession, in love, Every word that comes out of our mouth is to encourage and support and surround them with anointing, with wisdom, and with direction in the name of Jesus. And everybody shout, Pastor Darren, we stand with you in the name of Jesus greater things than we've ever experienced is on the way. Do you believe that with all of your heart? Now, I, I want this I want this young evangelist as you stand there for a moment. We're going to pray one more prayer. I want this young evangelist and his bride to come over here and stand right here. This young preacher, this young evangelist Evangelists of this church. It's Pastor Shara now, evangelists. They're not leaving you. They're evangelists representing harvest time. They're just as much connected. Pastoral leadership is over to Pastor Darren and, and Abby. But these evangelists, they know what it's about. They're going to go as the Lord leads them. But they're going to be here. 
in their home. They'll be here holding up Pastor Darren. So here's what I want us to do today. I want us to reach out now specifically. And I want Pastor Darren and the grandchildren and Pastor Duke, I want them to come and lay their hands upon now. Evangelist Lee and Sharon Farmer. Say this with me, Holy Ghost. Set them ablaze on the evangelistic field and use them mightily for God. Oh, Lord, let them see the greatest harvest of souls that they have ever witnessed. Churches that are going through struggles will know to call Pastor Lee and Evangelist Lee and his precious Sharon. And he'll know how to walk into that church that may be going through trials and troubles and tribulation and have a word for them from the Lord. Strengthen them. Protect them. Overshadow them. Cover them with your blood. And use them mightily, we pray. In the name that's above every name. The name of Jesus Christ. I got to do one more thing here. I got to do one more thing. I want everybody to form a, a little like I don't know how to describe it. A little ring around the rose. What do they call that? A little circle. Maybe four or five of you. Just kind of get in a circle. Just little little groups. Just little groups. I just felt something in my spirit right there. Right there. Hallelujah. Just kind of get in a group. We're all going to look at one another. Be sure you're in a group. Don't be by, don't be, don't be by yourself. Just get in a little group, and we're going to talk to each other. Are you ready for this? Say, I'm ready, Brother Dwight. We're ready. Now, we're going to talk to them. Don't, don't look at people at their ear, their hair. I like people that look right in my eye when I talk. Now, I want you to say this, just like you're in a conversation. Repeat after me. I just want you to know what I heard today. I believe. I'm a believer. I speak forth my faith for you and our congregation that the best is yet to come. That all the great things we saw the Lord do under the leadership of pastors Sharon and Lee Farmer. Oh, how we thank the Lord. But I speak my faith that even greater things are on the horizon under the leadership now of Pastor Darren and Abby. In the name of Jesus, I speak my faith this city will be one to God. In Jesus' name, that's my confession. And if you hear anything less that comes out of my mouth, well, don't do it. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm full of faith and not fear. The best is yet to come. Everybody that believe it now shout hallelujah. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Now, be seated in five minutes. I'm going to dismiss you, but just be seated. Let me put a little, uh, a little cap on this. Let me just put. The one thing that I need to finish is not to leave Job's comforter over there in a bad light. Mr. Personality. He rode my case for quite a while. And I did confess to you. I let it bother me at first, but after a while, it just, it just sort of went off. But one day on a Sunday night, he couldn't find a parking place. He had to park, these are his words, six blocks from the <laughs> church. And Pastor Darren, it wound up in a no parking zone. And they carted his car away. 
And so a note was sent up to me as I'm getting ready to preach, and it was from him. I've got to go. They towed away my car. He had to park it six blocks away. Well, I'm getting ready to preach. I've got my Bible open. And Sister Shay, I had that Bible open when I read that. I read it and I looked at it. And I saw who it was. And I thought about all the grief he's given me. And I said, under my breath, God is good. I want you to tow that car all the way to Waco and turn him over now to Pastor Darrell, Darren. Right now. But I didn't. I didn't. Well, maybe I thought it just a little bit. But the next day in my office on a Monday, Zonel's mother was my secretary. And she said to me, uh, Dwight, uh, she said, uh, brother so-and-so's here and he doesn't look like he's in a good mood. But he's demanding to see you. Well, I said, well, send him on in. Well, the guy that's given me grief, he walks into that office and I didn't know what to expect by his expression. But when I saw him, immediately it changed. And he began to weep. And he said, I've come in here to repent and ask you to forgive me. He said, all I could see what you were saying through the eyes of fear. And it dawned on me. I can't look through the eyes of what has been. I'm now looking through the eyes of faith. Will you forgive me? We both had a good cry. And he wept and I wept. And he became one of the strongest supporters of me while I was there for those three years. And I'm here to tell you, you may not see it at first. But just keep believing. And keep saying it. And keep speaking your faith. The best is yet to come. Well, that's my little talk for today, but here's what I want to say. They asked me at the end of the service, if you feel like today that you would like to uh, give an offering to our ministry, I just want you to obey the Holy Spirit. If you give, that's wonderful. If you don't give, God will take care of us. He's done it for a long time. He'll continue it. But I do believe this. I do believe that God will bless you you will help us go forth and continue our 52 going on 53 years of ministry and you're the ones that make it possible for us on the evangelistic field so I want you to know we promise to you will use that offering with integrity from the bottom of my heart first of all thank you for the privilege of being here today and thank you uh, evangelist Lee and pastor Darren for this wonderful privilege today to be in this great house god bless you and i expect to hear nothing but good news the best say it with me the best is yet to come give pastor darren a great big hand will you